Welcome everyone to the 22nd meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee and our 12th remote meeting. First item on the agenda is a decision on taking agenda item 4 on draft correspondence in private. Are we all agreed to take item 4 in private? If you can indicate whether you disagree, please do so. Thank you. Our next agenda item is evidence on the internal market as part of our future relationship negotiations inquiry. And can I welcome to our panel Catherine Barnard, Professor of European Union and Labour Law at the University of Cambridge, Michael Dugan, Professor of European Law, and Jean Monnet, Chair in EU Law at the University of Liverpool, and Professor Michael Keating, the Director of the Centre on Constitutional Change. I would remind members to give broadcasting staff a few seconds to operate your microphones before beginning to ask your question or witnesses to provide your answer. And I would be grateful if questions and answers could be kept as succinct as possible. So we will move straight to questions. Uh, I will begin with the first question and then be followed by Claire Baker, the Deputy Convener, and I will invite the panel to respond. I want to begin, if I may, by exploring with you the difference between the EU single market that we know and what the UK is proposing in the Internal Market Bill. In the European single market, I understand it is based on the principle of consent, uh, consent of the majority of the member states, consent of the European Parliament. Does the UK Government's proposal for an internal market embody the same commitment to consent and Notwithstanding, is the principle of majority consent different in the UK and EU context? And can I also explore with you the laws that govern the single market, which ensure that there is a level playing field through agreeing mutual recognition, harmonisation, minimum standards and non-discrimination? Uh, I understand that the EU allows member states to derogate from these rules. Um, in a number of very complex ways, and can I ask you if the UK legislation will allow the same derogation and justifiable exceptions, and if not, what the consequences will be for Scotland? Uh, who would like to go first? Uh, Professor Barnard. Thank you for that very rich question. Um, I will answer part of it, and I will leave my colleagues to answer other parts. Um, with the EU single market, um, it, is, it, it was initially premised on the idea of negative integration. Uh, the relevant treaty provisions, um, particularly on, for example, free movement of goods, um, are about removing barriers to trade, um, but subject always to quite significant um, exceptions. Uh, but actually, the EU um, discovered very quickly, and uh, indeed it was envisaged in the Treaty of Rome, that negative integration alone wouldn't be enough, and therefore there would be a need for harmonisation legislation, i.e. centralised legislation um, at, um, at EU level on matters as diverse as what might go into a headlight on a car or what might go into the composition of a particular product. And that legislation goes through the EU legislative processes, and as you rightly say, the European Parliament um, has uh, a significant role now as co-legislator under Article 114, which is the main legal basis for internal market measures. Now, clearly, the UK um, Internal Market Bill doesn't have that centralising component uh, um, uh, as envisaged in Article 114 of EU law. And it's much more about allowing, ostensibly, the four nations of the United Kingdom, um, traders in those four nations, to be able to carry on trading uh, across those nation frontiers. And so the starting point is essentially market access. And market access has two elements, mutual recognition and non-discrimination. And the mutual recognition principle essentially says that for product requirements, which is the jargon for things like uh, the composition of a product or the packaging of a product, product requirements uh, which um, are laid down under uh, Scottish law um, are deemed to be equivalent to those laid down under, for example, Welsh uh, 
law and therefore Scottish goods can be sold without restriction in um, Wales. Now I'll pause there because I imagine my colleagues would like to talk to you about your, the second part of your question, which is about um, exceptions and derogations. Thank you. Um, Professor Duggan. Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on the issue of um, derogations. There, there, are, there are three main um, ways by which the European single market um, allows for its member states to, as it were, protect their own um, social choices about issues such as environmental protection or consumer protection or labour protection. The first relates to what um, Catherine was talking about, the application of the treaty rules on free movement, negative integration, whereby you have principles of non-discrimination and mutual recognition, which are directly applicable and directly enforceable by individual traders before the courts. And there, EU law offers member states um, a, a wide range of public interest justifications for apparent barriers to trade, for example, through a refusal of mutual recognition. Um, as long as there's no direct discrimination against an incoming good or service provider, uh, a member state can basically rely on any valid public interest objective in order to justify its legislation, environmental protection, consumer protection, uh, labour rights and so on. Um, clearly, in the context of the UK Internal Market Bill, the system is very different. There are much more restricted range of justifications, public interest justifications available for uh, measures which would amount to a refusal of mutual recognition or some form of discrimination. So, in the UK context, a much narrower uh, range of justifications. Um, the second main vehicle that the EU uses is uh, harmonisation legislation for the internal market, which again Catherine referred to, the idea of uh, measures which are adopted primarily under Article 114 um, of the, the EU treaties, um, so as to harmonise standards across the EU. Um, those, those standards are explicitly directed in the treaties to be based on high levels of public interest protection, again, on the usual grounds of environmental protection, consumer protection, and so on. And then, uh, in, in, the, in the UK context, then I should point out that that's, I suppose, where the debate about common frameworks has taken place, which we might come back to later in the discussion. But as we know, um, that, that's quite a complicated set of negotiations which hasn't yet reached a conclusion. Um, the third main vehicle, then, by which the EU um, seeks to accommodate national preferences about public interest standards is what we sometimes call flanking legislation. And this is where you have autonomous standards. Um, specifically directed on establishing minimum common grounds of uh, environmental protection, consumer rights, labour rights, and so on. Um, in the UK context, the bill doesn't address that issue at all. The white paper um, which preceded the bill um, does uh, continue the UK government's promise that it has no intention of lowering standards, that it wants to um, maintain high standards, um, but the bill itself doesn't address those issues at all. And as we all know, in the UK constitutional context, in fact, there's no such thing as an entrenched uh, standard of environmental protection or social protection or labour protection because of the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. It can be a political commitment, um, but it's not really a constitutionally enforceable uh, minimum standard. Okay, thank you very much. Did Professor Keating, would you like to add to that? Yes, that's why I wanted two things. Of course, the Two things have uh, a lot in common. The UK internal market proposals are based upon the EU concept of an internal market. The difference is that the EU internal market principle is a dynamic principle. So, for many decades now, the EU has been trying to remove barriers to trade to create a more integrated market, whereas the idea of this bill is to preserve an in internal market which supposedly already exists. That changes the dynamics of it. They also have in common the internal market principle as a cross-cutting principle. It's not based upon the division of competences, as is the Scotland Act. So this could potentially come up in almost any area. It changes the nature of the devolution of settlements, depending on how far this is implied. That's also true in the EU, but within the EU there are a number of safeguards. One is the decision-making process, I think Catherine alluded to, that there is a procedure for qualified majority voting for the adoption of new European laws and regulations of various sorts. The European Parliament is involved, and there's the principle of proportionality and 
subsidiarity, which means that any rules must be no more detailed than is necessary and taken at the lowest level. That indeed is enforced by the European Court of Justice. And then there's also the role of the Commission that does the technical work, which is independent of the member state governments. There's nothing like that in the present bill, which just has the Commission and Markets Authority as an advisor to the UK government, but not having a regulatory role itself. I see. Um, but you've kind of answered my next question, actually, um, Professor Keating, because I was going to note that Sir David Edward had made uh, the, the same uh, observation with regards to the absence of proportionality and sub subsidiarity uh, in the UK internal market. Uh, proposals. And I know also that, that both Professor Duggan and Professor Keating in your submissions have suggested that the UK Internal Market Bill uh, means that the size of England compared to the other nations of the UK means that the internal market will be heavily influenced by decisions taken in England, which takes me back to the, the whole concept of the majority. Is it how will that work in practice? What will the impact of that be in Scotland, and how will it differ uh, from the way the evolution has worked up until now? Well, until now, the division of competence has been relatively clear. There have been some arguments, but it's been relatively clear what is reserved and what is devolved. This gives this transversal rule, which means that this could come up in just about any field, with the exception of those fields that are exempted in the bill, which include health and social services or such other matters that might be exempted. The question of England is that the bill doesn't stop Scotland making its own regulations in its fields. It just means that goods and services that meet English regulations will have to be marketable in Scotland. England is much bigger. If manufacturers are producing a product line, it would be cheaper just to do it according to English regulations for the big market rather than running a separate product line uh, for Scotland, and those bills will be allowed in. So England by will maybe become the, the default standard. Also, the UK government is the government of the UK and the government of England, so it's negotiating international trade deals. It may accept standards which it can then implement for England, and automatically those goods would be allowed in Scotland. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now move on to Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I'm interested in the issue of governance and how the, um, the the UK Internal Market Bill proposes a different model from how the European Union um, operates. And um, Professor Keating was talking about the, the role of the Commission in Europe being independent and regulatory in a different kind of model that's been proposed for the UK internal market. And in other papers, we've had a distinction drawn before between the more political nature of the UK internal market proposals compared to the um, EU. Could people maybe comment on the difference between the governance arrangements and any concerns you would have about the way in which the UK is approaching this? And maybe if Professor Keating wants to maybe go first, as, as you had mentioned in the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah OK. Uh, a single market or the internal market is not, a, is not a legal category. It's an economic concept. It can be interpreted in multiple different ways. It's very often controversial. We had the famous minimum of pricing of alcohol decision uh, in Scotland. So this cannot be considered as something purely technical and depoliticised. And it's not in Europe. The European Court makes a lot of decisions, which themselves are politically controversial. There's, there's no getting away from that. And indeed, the European Court of Justice, Court of Justice of the EU, to be precise, has been criticised for putting too much emphasis on market competition. Uh, so the EU system, we wouldn't say, is perfect, but at least the rules are made in an intergovernmental way. As for the technical advice, there, yes, the European Commission does a lot of the homework. It does have technical expertise there, and a lot of what comes out of Brussels is actually the result of technical committees and technical consultations. We don't have that, and that belongs to the Commission, which is independent of governments. Whereas in this proposal, the Competition and Markets Authority will be the advisor to the UK government. Devolved governments may consult it, but it is important 
okay, appointed by and responsible to the UK government. And many of us have been arguing over the last few years that in our intergovernmental system generally, there should be some kind of secretariat, some kind of independent source of advice, somebody to do the technical work and the homework, and that this body, whatever it is, should be responsible to all the governments of the United Kingdom and not just the UK government. Uh, would either of other witnesses wish to respond to the question? Um, I, 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 oh, go ahead, Catherine. Um, I would just like to make um, a couple of points on that. Um, yes, the European Commission clearly is supranational and therefore is not acting in the interest of a particular state, although I think most of us would accept it does have quite a strong uh, political dimension too, not least because it's headed up by um, the commissioners who are ultimately politicians. Uh, but they do do the heavy lifting of preparation of um, EU legislation, and indeed it has to go through all of the committees that Michael has referred to. You certainly don't have that um, in the Internal Market Bill. But I would like to make one smaller point, which is perhaps less dramatic, but um, I think has been very important in the EU, and that is about uh, draft technical standards. Um, and what you see is there's an obligation under an EU directive uh, that draft technical standards, before they ever get adopted, must be notified uh, to the Commission and then gets notified on to the Member States. And the Member States got an opportunity to raise their objections about those technical standards. So it's an ex-ante um, approach to governance rather than a sort of post hoc challenge, which is what we have in the Internal Market Bill. And to my mind, one of the, what would actually have helped to smooth some of the difficulties that your committee is already alluding to is to have some sort of equivalent in the Internal Market Bill so that there is, if Scotland is proposing to um, introduce a new technical standard, um, minimum price per unit for alcohol being a case in point, that this gets already gets discussed. Now, of course, the problem with the minimum price per unit of alcohol is how it fits into the current internal market bill framework. But the fact is there should be discussion in advance rather than you wait and um, have the um, CMA or the Office of the Internal Market looking into things after they've happened. And Professor Diggins. Oh, oh. oh, thanks. Um, I'll, I'll make just a couple of short comments, which are partly in response um, to Claire's question, but also link up with, with the previous question as well. Um, I think it's important to stress that this bill isn't really concerned at all directly with the process of what in an EU context would be called harmonisation. In other words, the adoption of legislation to establish common standards across the, the, the entire internal market. This bill is really focused on um, the idea of negative integration and the application of direct principles to the exercise of competence by the individual territories and how that exercise of competence should impact on trade relations. Um, and from that point of view, therefore, the bill doesn't really have very much to say about governance at all, because the application of these horizontal principles like mutual recognition and non-discrimination doesn't actually take that much by way of governance in order to have a, a very dramatic effect in practice. Effectively, if you want to think of it this way, um, the, 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 the principle of mutual recognition is about subjecting the exercise of regulatory competence to market forces. So in a way, laws become a product which have to compete with each other within the internal market to attract business, consumers, service providers and producers. Um, and I think that's why the, the, the size of the English economy is such an important point to highlight in this context. You know, if we take uh, the internal market of the EU, even the very largest member state, Germany, is, is far less than 20 percent of the entire EU population and economy. Um, there are 27 member states with very different sizes and very different strengths. Um, but in the UK, UK context, we're talking about four territories and one territory makes up. 80, 85 percent of both the population and the economy. So if you're going to have a system which is based on the operation of market forces, which is effectively what mutual recognition is, you're operating that system in a market which is entirely skewered in favour of one territory alone. And I think that's why I would endorse what, what Michael said previously, um, that the deregulatory pressures which are generated by the principle of mutual recognition, and it is true, it generates deregulatory pressures, will operate entirely in favour 
of English standards, it's difficult to see how it could operate to the benefit of Scottish or Welsh standards. But I think those are very separate from questions such as harmonisation and um, legislative procedures for establishing common UK standards, because this bill doesn't really have anything to say about that at all. Um, just to follow up on that type of discussion, um, the the UK government bill doesn't make any provision for devolved administrations' involvement in development and guidance, sorry, governance of the internal market. And the white paper has made clear that the evolution and overall shape of the UK internal market will be overseen by the UK Parliament um, and will be put to the UK Parliament for approval. So there's no role within that process for devolved governments or devolved parliaments. And it's whether the um, whether the Joint Ministerial Committee and the Common Framework are adequate mechanisms to address that. And so I'm interested in the panel's view of whether that is the that's a fair approach to take, the the, the way in which the um, the development and governance of the internal market is brought together is solely within the um, decision making power of the UK Parliament, UK government, and that the role for devolved administrations comes through common frameworks, which as somebody's already mentioned quite a bit of debate and discussion that's not finalised yet what the common market will look like. So, Professor Dugan, as you were talking about that last point, if you want to pick up again. Sure. That would be great. sure. Um, I think, again, it's probably useful to draw this distinction between what the Bill is seeking to address, which are the horizontal principles of mutual recognition and non-discrimination, and what the bill isn't seeking to address, which is the question of common frameworks or harmonisation and so on. Um, and, and I'll just make a quick point about it's sort of sort of quite um, so it does seek to address. Um, uh, the, the Sorry, Scott, what does horizontal mean? That's maybe just my ignorance, but you talk about horizontal alignment. What does that oh, sorry, it's, uh, the gen general principles, the general principles of mutual recognition and non-discrimination. Sorry, we use the term horizontal to mean generally applicable. Sorry. <laughs> okay, carry on. Sorry, but just to clarify, that was. Great. Um, uh, so, so these are uh, these generally applicable principles: mutual recognition, non-discrimination. I think the main feature of the governance structures within the bill to relating to those principles is the ability of UK government ministers to change the rules using delegated powers, in most cases without even having to consult the devolved institutions. Um, that is a pretty striking feature of this bill, that if we talked about mutual recognition as being a system essentially based on market forces, which are uh, imposed upon the exercise of competence, if we think of the uh, UK market as being dominated by England, as an economic and population centre. Not only that, but actually the UK government has the power to change the rules by which the market operates, because it has these quite extensive powers under the bill to, for example, change the derogations which are available for mutual recognition, to change the scope of the uh, rules which are subject to mutual recognition or non-discrimination principles. So from a governance point of view, that's a very striking feature of this bill, extensive delegated powers to the UK government to change the rules of the game when it comes to mutual recognition and non-discrimination. But when it comes to the separate process of common frameworks, of, of harmonisation, of whether there should be centralised intervention in the operation of the UK internal market, again, the bill doesn't have very much to say about this. So I think the real question is, if you feel satisfied with how the governance of the UK operates at the moment and the experience of negotiating the common frameworks, then you'll probably be satisfied with this bill because it doesn't do anything. If you don't feel satisfied with how the process of common frameworks has operated so far, then you'll probably be dissatisfied for the same reasons. You need to have confidence in the common frameworks. If you think if you have confidence in the common frameworks, you, you could live with the bill, or is that? If you have confidence in the process by which um, the common frameworks are being negotiated and finalised then you can probably think that the governance of the UK internal market overall will operate along similar lines. But the bill itself doesn't actually have any real impact on that. Um, and again, maybe from an EU perspective, you might say that that in itself is very striking, because there is no attempt to reform the governance structures of the UK 
with a view to doing what the EU tries to do, which is to create a sense of confidence and mutual trust between all of the participating territories that legislation is being adopted in a way which represents all of their interests on a, if not equal footing, at least uh, roughly equal footing. I think Professor Barnard wants to get in. Can I add a couple of points to that? One is a very limited point and one's a bigger picture point. The limited point is that if um, there are going to be changes to the um, bill, for example, to the uh, uh, regulatory framework um, as laid down by the bill, for example, um, if uh, those um, uh, things which are covered by uh, relevant requirements, for example, are going to be expanded or the exceptions are going to be expanded, there is um, the power um, in the bill to consult Scottish, Welsh, uh, Northern Ireland um, ministers. To give you an example, um, look at clause um, 3.9. But the trouble is, it's, it looks like it's been added something as an afterthought, because there's no, although the bill is very detailed in certain areas, it's, there's no detail about how, what time period there should be a consultation or um, what happens if the consultation breaks down, or what happens if the cons there's strong a view expressed by the Scottish or Welsh ministers, and uh, Westminster, Westminster doesn't take that into account. That's my narrower point. My bigger point is that if you look at um, the way the EU single market operates, it doesn't just operate on the basis of having these principles um, that uh, float about. So it doesn't just operate based on mutual recognition and non-discrimination. These are bedded in a much wider governance structure. And by that, I mean they're embedded in a structure which is there to develop trust. So the Commission can bring proceedings against a state that doesn't comply with Article 34, for example. Um, likewise, individuals can bring cases. And in both instances, whether it's an individual claim or the Commission bringing enforcement proceedings, they are likely to end up before the European Court of Justice, an independent court, which will adjudicate on what's going on between the uh, individual um, nations. Now, again, you do not have that structure um, clearly set up in the Internal Market Bill. All you have is the Competition Markets Authority or the, and within it uh, the Office um, of the, uh, the Internal Market. But all it does is to make some investigation and write some reports. But those reports can just sit collecting dust on the shelves. It's a very, very weak, broader governance context than compared with the EU. Thank you very much. We now move on to our, our next questioner, who is Dean Lockhart, MSP. Thank you very much, uh, convener, and good morning, panel. I would like to uh, take a step back and ask the panel whether they think some form of internal market regulation is required following the transition period, uh, regardless of whatever concerns or issues they may have with the current drafting of the bill. Uh, there is a view uh, which has been expressed that the common frameworks themselves might be sufficient. Uh, but my question is, would the common frameworks in themselves be enough to deal with the transfer of what is basically 45 years of EU regulation and EU case law? Um, would the common frameworks be enough in themselves to, to deal with that transfer, or is some form of regulation uh, necessary for the internal market? Perhaps I could start with Professor Keating. Thank you. Yes, I think generally speaking, the, the frameworks process would be a preferable way of going about this because it's not clear to me what is going to come up that might not be covered by frameworks. And indeed, it's not clear to me what the scope of this bill is. There are all courts of powers in this bill. It may be just seen as a backup to be used in emergency cases where the frameworks don't work, in which case I can't see why we should be giving all these powers to UK ministers when we don't know how they're going to be used. Uh, there's, there's really a lack of philosophy in this bill or the accompanying documents as to what really the single market or internal market is all about. So I would give frameworks a go. Another point that I wanted to make in response to the last discussion, but is relevant to your question, is the comparison between the frameworks process and the internal market process. And this is the difference between consultation and consent. These are different principles. 
and we have built into the devolution settlement consent mechanism. The Civil Convention for Primary Legislation uh, is a consent mechanism. In other cases, it's just uh, consultation. Now, the Civil Convention, I know it can be overridden, it's not terribly strong, but at least it's there, and it gives some protection for the devolved legislatures on primary legislation. It does not apply to statutory instruments, except in the case of, of the Withdrawal Act, where there is some provision there. But generally speaking, it doesn't apply to statutory instruments. And this bill works on the basis of statutory instruments with affirmative resolution. And it's, it's striking then that there's no consent mechanism. The best we get is, is consultation. So if we are going to get these powers, if they are needed as a fallback, as you're saying, to cover things not covered by frameworks, it would seem normal that there should be a consent principle built in. So far, the frameworks process has been built upon consent. No frameworks have been imposed. And it seems they're probably not going to be, and will not be taken. So the frameworks process shows that this can work, and I would expect something like that to be built into this bill, rather than simply consultation. Really anything. Thank you very much. Perhaps I could ask the same question uh, to Professor Barnard and Professor Dugan, uh, just to briefly get your views on whether some form of uh, regulatory framework is, is required. I don't have much to add to what uh, Professor Keating's already said, but I think that what is striking about this bill is the absence of an equivalent of Article 114. And Article 114 is the legal base um, in the TFEU for um, uh, the EU to legislate um, on an area, for example, consumer protection or environmental protection, where up until then uh, the individual nations have had different environmental standards. What you're not having is that sort of um, power, or at least a, a, a thinking about how to develop that power apart from through the common frameworks. And I think it's striking how little um, there is, the, 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 how little there is in the bill and the white paper which join those join those dots together. Uh, Professor Dugan. Uh, so thanks, and hello again, Jean. Um, I, I think we should be careful. <laughs> I think we should be careful to separate whether whether a challenge or a problem exists um, from whether this bill provides the most appropriate or the right answer to that challenge or problem. And I think there's a little bit of a risk in the current debate that um, opposition to this bill then leads some of us to question whether the actual underlying problem or challenge even exists in the first place. Um, I think it is important to acknowledge that in any territory, and we're talking any territory, the UK is far from unique here, where you have a group of uh, individual territories that trade with each other, but have divergent regulatory competences. You're going to have barriers to trade and distortions of competition, and you need some sort of framework to address that. It's true in Canada, in America, in Australia, in the EU. It's you know it's it's true in any situation where you have a group of uh, territories which have a strong and close relationship with each other, but they have divergent regulatory competences. Now, the reason it hasn't been much of a problem in the UK is because during the period of EU membership, when devolution was created, the EU did most of this stuff for us. And really, this becomes an issue after the expiry of the transition period, because we will become a country not dissimilar to Canada or Australia or America, or in fact, a territory like the EU where you have individual territories that have divergent regulatory competences capable of creating barriers to trade. So the problem is a legitimate one. The real question, I think, is does this bill provide the correct or the desirable answer to that problem? And there, I think, there is, of course, enormous room for discussion, for opposition, for reservations, for improvement and, and as well. But, but I think we need to be careful not to deny that the, the underlying challenge exists, because it clearly does. The real question is how far this bill provides a, a desirable answer to that problem. Thanks very much. That, that was very helpful uh, in, in terms of getting your views on, on that issue. I'd like to move on to a question of um, the transfer, how the transfer of EU legal principles uh, will work when they carry over into UK law. According to SPICE, the, the Scottish Parliament Independent Research Team 
Obviously, a number of EU legal principles will be carried over into the internal market proposals, including mutual recognition and, and non-discrimination. Uh, perhaps I could start with Professor Barnard, because in your paper, I think it was your conclusion, you say that the internal market bill simplifies some of the complexity of EU law. Uh, perhaps you could elaborate on, on this point, please, because presumably it's going to be impossible for the UK internal market bill proposals to take whole scale all of the principles of EU law. So there has to be, I guess, a point at which we take some or most of those principles, but, but not all of those points. Um, so, Professor Barnard, perhaps I could ask you to elaborate on, on the point you made in, in your conclusion that the bill simplifies some of the complexity of EU law. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, um, the, the Court of Justice's jurisprudence on particularly free movement of goods has evolved over time, not necessarily uh, to, with the benefit of clarity. Um, to give you, to, to put it crudely, uh, the narrative goes as follows: that in the early days, it was simply discrimination that was prohibited. Uh, then, um, Cassis de Dijon, that major decision, um, which anyone who's done EU law at a law school will know and love, um, uh, came along and introduced the concept of mutual recognition. Some people see that as a permutation of indirect discrimination; uh, others do not. And then um, the Court of Justice went off on something of a frolic um, with a line of case law about what's called certain selling arrangements. And those were rules not regulating importers, but they were regulating retailers. And the subsequent jurisprudence there was a complete dog's breakfast. Um, that's not really a technical term, but that really is the truth. Um, and then after that, the Court of Justice seemed to shift away from a discrimination model to a market access model. Now, I just want to pause here because there's um, confusion of terminology. Under the Internal Market Bill, um, the umbrella term is market access, and that embraces mutual recognition and non-discrimination. But in the EU world, market access means something else. And market access means, is there a rule that stops me as a trader doing what I want in another country? even though um, a domestic trader is subject to the same rule. In other words, it's non-discriminatory, but it, it makes my life just difficult to try and break onto a new market. Now, what I'm just in answer to your question, um, what you see is that that version of market access has basically been dropped from the internal market bill, and it's, there's been a retreat to the principle of non-discrimination, which I should say is essentially the approach that the U.S. Supreme Court um, adopts as well um, in respect to the Dormant Commerce Clause. Um, and um, mutual recognition is prominent. Um, the confusion about the frolic that I referred to in respect to certain selling arrangements actually has been built in rather sensibly into the Internal Market Bill. Um, because and, and in respect of certain selling arrangements, you find that um, in the discrimination section, um, and essentially uh, in the discrimination section of the Internal Market Bill, uh, a rule which is non-discriminatory, for example, um, a rule that regulates opening times of shops, should, should shops be shut on a Sunday. Um, that is non-discriminatory. It doesn't make life more difficult for me, the out-of-state trader, the, the in-state trader. Nobody's goods can be sold on a Sunday. And those rules are not directly discriminatory. They're not indirectly discriminatory. They fall outside the scope um, of, of, of the prohibition in the Internal Market Bill. That's probably more detailed than you wanted, but that's why that, that I hope explains why I said that some of the complexity has been of, of um, EU rules on free movement of goods has been removed. Oh, that, that's very helpful indeed. Thank you very much. And uh, Professor Keating and Professor Duggan, very briefly, would you have anything to, to add to, uh, to that? No, I, no, I don't. Professor um, Duggan? Maybe, maybe. Yeah, sure. Maybe I'll just um, uh, put put a slight gloss on 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 the issue. Um, I think we we in, in the UK um, need to sort of accept the idea that the, the internal market feels very new to us, but it's not a new problem in the world at large. Um, 
trade law as it's developed over the past many, many decades in various jurisdictions, including within the EU, um, provides us with a set of concepts and a set of tools. And although the terminologies may change, the concepts and the tools are pretty universal. Virtually every jurisdiction draws upon the same ideas to address roughly the same problems. So I, I think we should certainly look at the experience of other jurisdictions, including the EU, so as to learn valuable lessons about what works and how it works, why problems arise and how they're best to resolve. But I certainly don't think we should be tied to copy any other single market model or internal market model, because the, the needs and the circumstances of every territory are going to be unique. So I, I think it's less important that we worry about copying the EU or copying Canada or copying Australia than, than that we use the toolbox of trade law to address the unique circumstances of the UK. And, and I think this brings us right back to where we started, that the, the feature of the UK internal market, which distinguishes it from every other internal market on earth, is the size of England compared to the size of the other territories, which you simply don't have in any other context. And I think that does mean that the UK internal market has a, a very basic choice to make, Either it finds a way of somehow, and I use the term uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a jovial way, taming English dominance. Um, in other words, finding a way to, to protect the prerogatives of the Scottish and Welsh institutions against the pure market power of England within the UK internal market, or you simply allow the English market power to dominate the UK internal market and you don't provide any particular safeguards for the exercise of competence by Scotland and Wales. Obviously, those are two extreme positions. This bill tends towards the latter. There are some safeguards, a few safeguards, but on the whole, this bill acts on the basis that we simply accept English market dominance and let it let market forces play its role. If that's the solution, then this bill does the job. If it's a solution that people don't find desirable, then this bill is problematic. Thank you very much. Thank you, much. Convener. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lockhart, if there's time. Uh, Mr. Stevenson is next. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, at the outset, Michael Keating said there is a UK uh, internal market. Um, so I'm starting from that view viewpoint. And I want to just test of whether we actually need this legislation at all, what the effect should be if we if we find ourselves without this legislation passing. And I want to use a very specific uh, proposal that is currently actively uh, being considered in Scotland, and that is the introduction of a deposit return scheme. And let me just focus narrowly uh, on the return of reusable bottles for soft drinks. Um, as, 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 one, as one thing. In Europe, we have got our DRS schemes running in various countries in Europe, quite different in different countries. Sweden is an example. Um, now, if we introduce a deposit return scheme in Scotland, we require the label on the bottles that are participating in the scheme be specific to the Scottish deposit return scheme, i.e. different from what is elsewhere. But it seems to me that that uh, does not inhibit a company based in Barhead, a company based in Basildon, a company based in Belfast, or a company based in Bangor from having access to that Scottish market. There are no barriers uh, created uh, by the existence of that scheme. Would this bill force us in Scotland to accept English labelled uh, bottles into the Scottish market? Um, and, and, and therefore, markets that are actually participating in the English deposit return scheme, should they introduce one, which I think they probably will, is that one of the effects? Uh, and at the moment, it would work perfectly well if we don't legislate at all. So why do we need the legislation, and how would it affect just that narrow example? And I think I probably would want to go to Michael Dugan, uh, if I may, in the first instance, because of the, the remarks he's most recently. Sure. Um, it, it's a really good example. Um, it's a really good example. Um, I think I'll start just by saying again um, and, and highlighting the point that I made before. We just we should distinguish between is there an actual challenge or a problem that needs to be solved versus is this bill the right solution or answer to that problem? Um, there is most definitely a problem. 
in the sense that if Scotland decides to have different labelling requirements for goods from England or Wales, then it does create a barrier to trade, and you've got to decide what to do with that barrier to trade. So the problem Sorry, can as I, an can I intervene, Professor Dugan. Isn't that barrier equal for a company in Basildon, Barhead, Belfast, and Bangor? It's an equal barrier, whatever do, state a part of the UK you're in. And, and you, but, but the barrier exists, and you've got to decide how to deal with it. Now, if, for example, this was, in, this was EU law in Cassis de Dijon, the answer would be that the Scottish uh, institutions could justify that barrier to trade against an English importer by relying on the public interest of environmental protection. The answer under this bill, however, is you can't, because there is no environmental protection justification for a refusal of mutual recognition in respect of a product requirement like a labelling requirement, like a labelling uh, requirement. So it's certainly possible to have an internal market rule which would allow Scotland to fully enforce its environmental labelling requirements against incoming goods from England or Wales, but this bill does not allow you to do that. So two two real points to, to make about that. First of all, we we should distinguish the challenge from the solution. Is this bill the right solution? Well, from a, the point of view of the exercise of Scottish devolved competences, it definitely is not. Second point: Why is that true? Because if Scotland enacts this labelling requirement, but it can't actually enforce it against the eighty five percent of the economy which is English imports then there's no point in having the labelling requirement at all, because it's simply rendered completely inoperable in practice. That isn't to say, however, that you couldn't have an internal market system which would produce the opposite result. So again, I think we should be very careful to say there is a challenge here that we need to find some sort of answer to, but this bill provides a heavily skewed answer, which is effectively about unleashing market forces upon the exercise of devolved competences with very little scope to justify the different preferences that Scotland might have from the preferences of England. Uh, thank you. That, that, that sounded quite a complete answer, but uh, if, uh, if Professor Keating and Professor Barnard want to briefly supplement that, uh, can I go to Professor Keating first? Yes, everybody in this debate is agreed that there is an issue here because all the governments have bought into the frameworks process. There's something there. The problem with this single market is it's a very ill-defined concept. It's a highly political concept. It relies on judgments about the proper balance between the scope of the market and public regulation. And so it's not purely a neutral technical matter. And this has come up in the EU and in other jurisdictions as well. So we need to know what the scope of this is likely to be how far the UK government thinks that the single market would be progressed. In the European Union, as I said earlier on, it's a continuing process. It's been going on for decades, gradually building the single market through a series of measures, court judgments, political decisions, and so on, many of them highly political. And given that that is the case, given that these issues are highly political, we need to know what is the scope of this power and how are these rules going to be made, which gets us back to the point that all of us have been making. What is the nature of decision making here? Uh, and who is going to be deciding, who is going to define what the single market means, let alone uh, apply it? These are intensely political decisions. They should be addressed in a political arena with all the voices brought to bear, including those of the devolved nations as well as the UK Parliament. And this bill doesn't really provide that. Professor Barnard? I had uh, two points to, to what um, has just been raised. Um, the first one is um, the fundamental problem um, with the legislation that you're proposing and how it fits with the Internal Market Bill is that the mutual recognition principle would apply to it, and the only exceptions in the bill are about human, animal, or plant health, and thus environmental protection isn't one of them. So the first point is that, in my view, the exceptions uh, in the bill are too narrow and, and expressly don't deal with your very valid piece of legislation. Uh, my second point is, let's assume the legislation goes through as is, i.e. the Internal Market Bill legislation goes through as it is. 
So you're not going to be able to um, enforce your labelling requirement against English products. Um, yes, English products will be allowed to be sold in Scotland without um, the Scottish label. But of course, ultimately, it gives consumers the choice. Do they um, buy uh, an English labelled product or do they buy a Scottish labelled product with a Scottish, um, essentially Scottish branding? And you may well find that even though it's not enforceable against um, English goods, the Scottish goods get some sort of benefit from the Scottish consumers who exercise their purchasing decisions in the way they choose. Uh, thank you for that. I'll just make the observation before moving on to my next uh, small question uh, that, that, of course, if Scotland introduces the deposit return scheme, that increases the purchase price differentially compared to a uh, non label. So that's why the problem is non trivial. Um, the, the, the other thing I just wanted to explore very briefly uh, there are a couple of examples of a equal decision making. Uh, in uh, UK law already, um, the first of which is the UK Climate Change Committee, where the governance arrangements and the appointment of people to that requires the unanimous support of ministers in all four jurisdictions. And as a previous climate change minister, I actually experienced that and uh, was able to uh, uh, see off a proposal that came from the UK government. It didn't emerge in the public gaze, so it didn't become political, so you could do it. It was quite interesting. And the other one used to be the British Waterways Board, where all decisions were jointly made by Scottish and UK ministers. So I found myself as a minister very strangely um, having to give my consent to the sale of land in Birmingham. Um, and, and that was the legal environment. So there are a couple of relatively modest examples of putting into UK law equality between the jurisdictions. Um, is, is, is that the kind of model that we sensibly should be having for making these important decisions about the operation of the market? And I expect it, it, almost our three witnesses might simply all say yes, yes, and yes. I don't know. Professor Barnard. On the level, of course, the answer. To, of course, at one level, the answer is um, yes. Um, you would think this would be the sensible way forward, and that takes us back to the common frameworks um, and working together. Um, of course, the reality is, will that go through um, any uh, Westminster legislation where the uh, Conservatives have a majority of 80? Um, and of course, it, at the moment, it puts England in a very strong position, and most of these um, Majority MPs are English, and so um, while <laughs> intellectually and uh, constitutionally, and you could see that reasonable people working together would be the way forward, it, it may just not be possible to get this through the Internal Market Bill, which is already so political. I just should say, as a footnote, it strikes me very much that all of the discussion, at least in England, about the IMB has been about clauses 42, 43, and 45. And there's been no public discussion about the bits of the bill that you are particularly interested in. Uh, maybe that will change, but um, it, 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 none of these, I'm, I'm not seeing any of these issues being um, flipped the other way around, because, of course, in England, the boot is very firmly on the English foot. Uh, let me try to get brief answers from the other two professors, otherwise the convener will get grumpy with me. Um, Professor Keating, perhaps, first? Uh, yes, this goes to the heart of the devolution settlement. <laughs> come before this parliament many times over the last 20 years, making this point that ultimately the, we're not a federation. The UK government has the last word, or the UK parliament has the last word, and with this case, UK ministers have the last word. Unless we're going to go to a federal system which raises any other issues, we've got to find some other mechanism. And here, the principle of consent, I think, is important. It will be said, well, you're asking for a Scottish veto on things. That wouldn't necessarily be the case, but some kind of institutional mechanism that is more than a statutory instrument requiring the assent only of the Westminster Parliament should be required for this kind of change, because this is a constitutional change, changing the competences. If you do it by primary legislation, the Sewell Convention is invoked. We don't even have this in this bill. So this is a particularly glaring example of Westminster always being able to have the last word. And finally, Professor Dugan. Sure. Um, I, I think I think 
the, the, the common message which is emerging um, from, I think, from all three of the witnesses here, and certainly from the discussions I've been having uh, much in a much broader context with my colleagues across the UK, is that from a devolved perspective, this bill is highly problematic. But there are really two ways that you can deal with the highly problematic nature of the bill from a devolved perspective. The first is to tip the bill as it stands and its fundamental assumptions that there should be general principles to govern the UK internal market with legal enforceability before the courts and just live with it. In that case, there are ways that you can improve the bill, but they're fairly limited in nature. We've all hinted that, that you really need a wider range of justification so as to cover the environment, consumers, labour rights, and so on. That's the first solution, is just work with the bill and try and make it as best as we can from, from improving the actual terms. The alternative is to simply go back to the drawing board and rethink how you approach the entire governance of the UK internal market. And again, I think the fairly clear message that everyone is giving is try not to have these generally applicable principles, which are directly enforceable before the courts, try and have some form of pre-legislative dialogue between equals so as to find political solutions to these complex regulatory challenges. The problem is that that is effectively saying, rip up this bill and start again. But I think those are the two main options to work with. Either you try and improve the bill on its own terms by, for example, expanding the scope of justifications, or you simply try and rewrite the entire approach. Thank you very much, Professor Dugan. And we now move on to Beatrice Bushurt's questions. Beatrice. Thank you. Thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. I think my question's probably been answered. I'm just going to ask one question of each of the members, but um, I shall ask it anyway. Um, we're already discussing, and it probably follows on from Stuart's line of questioning about labelling as well. Um, you know, the, trying to protect the existing differences in policy between the four administrations. Uh, if a devolved administration wants to change or toughen its existing standards, um, then the bill would appear to come into force with, against it. So, uh, looking at um, what Peter Drummond, uh, a senior member of the Royal Corporation of Architects in Scotland, said um, about our, our more robust fire safety regulations in Scotland, um, could fall foul of this bill. And he was speaking, obviously, in the context of, of the Grenfell Tower um, fire and worried about whether our better safety regulations could ever be improved further under the bill. Um, in response, uh, the UK government said to the BBC that the Scottish Parliament, and I quote, um, will continue to be able to set their own regulations. But, but the white paper um, seems clear that it's the opposite direction. Um, so I suppose I just if you could build a bit more on what was already said in terms of Stuart's question and, and how this, if we wanted to improve regulations, how that would how that would work or not, as the case may be. Would should do any one of us? Yes, anyone. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the the bill is based on a, a sort of general proposition that existing provisions don't fall within the scope of its mutual recognition or non-discrimination principles unless they are substantively revised. Now, the test is substantively changed. It's not substantially. So, in fact, any amendment that would change the, the substance, even in a relatively minor way, but that would change the substance of an existing provision, will then become subject to the bill. Now, on the one hand, that acts, in effect, as a powerful disincentive not to change the law, because if the existing rules are protected from scrutiny, but any changes to those rules then become fully subject to the internal market principles, there's already a powerful disincentive not to change the law at all. But if you do then change the rules and, 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 and it falls within the scope of the mutual recognition principle for goods, then the only justification that you can use to enforce those higher standards against imported goods from England is to prevent the spread of pests, diseases or unsafe foodstuffs. You can't use your, your new um, uh, amended rules, for example, so as to improve general standards of public health or public safety, to protect the environment, to protect consumers and so on. Now, on the one hand, the UK government is technically correct. The Scottish Parliament can still enact new rules to have higher fire safety standards for certain products. But of course, that's 
just a, a misleading rep representation of the impact of the bill. The impact of the bill is that those improved standards will only be binding upon Scottish producers. They can't be enforced against English producers selling their goods into Scotland. And given the nature of the UK market, where England is 85% of the population in the economy, you may as well not have the rule at all. Because all you're effectively doing is imposing higher compliance costs on your own producers and putting them at a competitive disadvantage, and you can't actually enforce the rules against the vast majority of products on your market which are being imported from England. So technically speaking, the UK government is correct, but only if you totally ignore the entire bill that we're talking about. <laughs> um, the actual impact of the bill is to render the exercise of that Scottish confidence um, uh, nugatory in practice. Thank you for that. Does uh, Catherine or um, Professor Keating have any response? Um, I agree. In, I agree entirely with um, what Michael has said. The, what I, I was reflecting on while he was talking is what happens if um, a, a council in Scotland um, specified in its procurement that it will uh, it will require only Scottish standards, um, uh, fire safety standards, to apply. Uh, or to, uh, the, 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 the products, the building materials used in um, the building must comply with Scottish fire safety standards. Um, now, of course, we don't know what's going to happen to the procurement uh, regime. Um, as we know that Scot Scotland essentially um, has uh, uh, does apply, well, of course, at the moment applies the EU rules, but um, with a rather distinctive flavour um, compared with. England, um, presumably, then the problem would be that there could be a challenge by a British, uh, sorry, by an English manufacturer of um, cladding, for example, that the application of the tendering process, which specifies Scottish safety standards only, is in breach of the mutual recognition principle. Um, and then the question is, can they actually challenge that as a manufacturer? In England, or would they go to the um, Competition and Markets Authority and flag this up as a problem? Then the question is, what happens if you have a private landlord who says, um, "I'm doing it for a um, housing association or a charity that says we want to procure according to um, Scottish fire safety standards only"? To what extent uh, does the bill bite on them as well? And that is what's under EU law. That's called the horizontal situation problem. And I don't think that's been um, sorted out in the bill. I don't know if, if Michael's got a view on that. Thank you. Have you completed your questions, Beatrice? No, I was, I was waiting. I thought Professor Keating might have a, have a response. Uh, no, no, I don't think Catherine was running to me as it, or the other Michael, but, but, but no, I, I, I couldn't add anything. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. And um, we now move on to Annabel Ewing, MSP. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I find the conversation very interesting, not least because I had practiced um, EU law in Brussels for 10 years. So, uh, the Cassis de Dijon, I hadn't thought about that case for quite a while, actually, but um, on memories. Um, could I ask uh, Professor Barnard and Professor Keating first? Um, you know, going back to the issue of the bill, uh, mutual recognition, the the comparison with the EU single market, which is quite marked in that there are uh, much wider public policy exceptions, if we can term it that. Plus, there are remedies. Now, I accept Professor Keating's point. Everything in life can be regarded as political, but equally, uh, there is a system of law. There's a lot of case law. There is a court. Uh, you know, individuals and businesses can go to the court, uh, and the contrast uh, that uh, this bill presents seems to be very marked. And I have two questions in that regard. One, uh, looking specifically at a controversial issue, uh, obviously that has arisen, which is uh, looking ahead to uh, any future UK-US trade deal, uh, and the, the requirement for Scotland then to uh, uh, import into its market. Um, uh, food products with lower quality standards, the, the ex examples frequently given, chlorinated chicken and hormone-fed beef. Obviously, farmers in Scotland are very, very concerned 
about this. Um, would Scotland be in any position whatsoever to prevent this, to avoid a race, a risk of a race to the bottom? And second, um, assuming that that's not the case, I'm taking into account all the other comments made. It would seem to me to be very clear, leaving to one side the, the, the issue of you know membership as a whole of the EU or not, leaving that issue to one side, parking that issue, but just looking at the single market. Is it fair to say that actually? Uh, for, for farmers, for traders, for businesses, consumers in Scotland, they are more protected as being members of the EU single market than the uh, prospect of what this bill presents. One last little point being here, the talk of trust and discussions, but we've heard that the UK government doesn't need to consult. Um, and maybe I could just put that into context with the most recent example of a blatant um, Disregard for the uh, Scottish Government and Parliament, where we heard yesterday, I think yesterday evening, the UK Chancellor is unilaterally scrapping the UK budget. No discussions uh, prior to that announcement with uh, the devolved nations, including with the Scottish Government. I mean, that's breathtaking disregard. So I think the, the idea of any trust, I think we can park that as well, because clearly there's not a trust agenda here. But sorry, to go back to the two specific points, it would be interesting to hear comments from both professors. Thank you. Start. Should I start? No, sorry, Mr. Uh, yeah, well, can I say something about the role of courts generally? In the UK devolution settlement, there's been an agreement to try and keep things out of the courts. There's been very little devolution jurisprudence, and most of that is concerned European issues, either EU law or European Convention on Human Rights law. So our courts don't have a lot of experience. The Court of Justice on the European Union, on the other hand, has a lot of experience on that. It is a rather specialised court because it started out as a court of the common market. It's expanded, of course, since then. It has been criticised because it doesn't, so it is said, take into sufficient account of, of social considerations as opposed to market considerations. So if we're going to bring the courts in, we've got to think about what kind of things the courts will do, what expertise they will bring to bear, bearing in mind that these are uh, contentious issues and that the preference so far has not been to do that. Now, on the issue of trade deals, yes, it is clear in this bill that imported goods will also be subject to mutual recognition. So if a product is imported into England, it can be sold in other parts of the United Kingdom. People talk about hormone beef and chlorinated chicken and so on. Well, if these are hazardous to health, then they can be banned. Otherwise, if there are ethical or other reasons, it seems that they can't be banned. Uh, another critical point is, yes, Scotland can impose its own standards, but goods in the market will be allowed to come in, maybe produced to lower standards and maybe cheaper. This is a particular problem for Scottish agriculture, which you mentioned, because Scottish agriculture simply cannot compete on price. It competes on quality. And that is why Scottish farmers are in favour of high regulatory standards. Yes, they're a burden, but they protect the Scottish produce, distinctive Scottish produce, uh, and uh, protect them against competition from, from cheaper goods. Uh, that is, I think, the principal problem in, in relation to agriculture and the concern that farmers are expressed about this. Professor Barnard? I'd, I'd like to make a couple of points. The first, um, just to reflect on your um, reflections about Cassis de Dijon. As you may know, it's 40 years old um, last year, um, and uh, there's been a number of low-level celebrations. But uh, just to feed into an earlier point that was raised before that, actually the principle of mutual recognition has been around for um, well over a century. Um, and indeed, there's some early examples um, in um, of recognition of qualifications, which date back to um, the late 19th century. So it does confirm that mutual recognition, as Michael Dugan said, is part of a well-established toolkit. But it's the way the toolkit's being operat operationalized in the bill that's the problem, it seems to me, uh, because it stops Scotland from doing what clearly Scotland wants to do, because the exceptions are so narrow, and the exceptions, as you know, are in Schedule 1, um, it, the exception could only be where there is a human, um, animal or plant health are affected. If you drill down into Schedule 1, uh, 
it's not good enough just to say, well, actually, we've got reservations about chlorinated chicken because um, the US will say it's perfectly safe. We've got no track record of people falling ill from having um, eaten it. And yet the, the, the conditions laid down in Schedule 1, um, Paragraph 2, um, it's got to be unsafe food, but it's not clear that chlorinated chicken actually satisfies or doesn't satisfy that, uh, that it's a, a unsafe. Um, and it's got to be a serious threat to human health. And of course, the US would argue, and the UK, or England at least, would argue that chlorinated chicken isn't a serious threat. And furthermore, there's got to be an assessment um, provided by the Scottish administration based on the available evidence to show this serious threat. So the long and the short of it is that um, the mutual recognition principle will drive a coach and horses through any attempts at the um, Scottish government wanting to reflect local preferences for not having um, uh, chlorinated chicken or GMO products, for example, where the um, this, these it's it's about rather rather more about general health or rather more about general consumer choice, not because you can't prove the very high thresholds which are set in Schedule One. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Brennan, for that technical clarification. It's very helpful um, that we are reminded that the bar is set very, very high as a matter of practice, very unlikely to be met. If I could t uh, raise my other point with Professor Dugan, um, I mean, you know, we're talking about mutual recognition, and I take the point that it's not a new legal concept, but in the context, particularly of the EU single market, uh, looking at this bill, Hearing what's been said, it seems to me that we have the mutual recognition of Jonah and the whale, uh, a one-way mutual recognition with London's way or the highway. And uh, I just wonder if Professor Dugan would agree with the general thrust of that comment and uh, would opine as to whether he feels that um, in terms of opportunity and protections for Scottish business, Scottish farmers, Scottish consumers, uh, there are more advantages uh, in terms of the structure of the EU single market than there are uh, under this UK internal market bill. Um, I, I, I agree completely with the thrust of the comment. I, I, I expressed the, the same point um, in slightly different terms with some of your colleagues um, uh, yesterday. Um, I, I described this bill as Cassius de Dijon on steroids. And, and that's effectively what it is. It's taken the principle of mutual recognition that was articulated by the European Court of Justice in Cassis de Dijon and applying it with full force, but stripped of all of the safeguards for the public interest, for higher regulatory standards that were incorporated into the judgment in Cassis de Dijon itself and have since come to characterize the operation of the European single market. So this is very much mutual recognition on steroids. Um, the bill in itself would be highly problematic in any internal market because it's effectively saying we're going to let market forces determine regulatory standards in practice. You know, you can all ha pick your own standards, but we're going to let the market decide which of those standards is going to prevail. That's the effect of this sort of absolutist mutual recognition, which is embodied in the bill. But again, um, we really have to come back to the idea that if that would be problematic in any internal market, it would be problematic in the EU or Canada or Australia or America. It's triply problematic in the UK because of the size of England and the dominance of Westminster. Because what it means is that the market forces unleashed by the principle of mutual recognition are not operating in a neutral manner between England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. The sheer market size of England means that market forces will lead English standards to be prevalent. And while Scotland and Wales might be able to enact their own regulatory standards, all they're doing effectively in many cases is penalizing their own producers and undermining their ability to compete with English imports and not achieving the actual public interest objectives that they set out to achieve in the legislation in the first place because they're unenforceable against the English economy, which is producing, in effect, extratorial effects within Scotland and Wales. So I absolutely agree with, with, with your entire critique. 
Um, of course, the EU single market is designed to avoid all of those problems. And, and, and some of the previous questions, we, we discussed some of the ways that the EU single market tries to do that through the role of the Commission, through the role of the Council, the European Parliament, and so on. Um, so, of course, the EU single market um, tries to avoid all of those issues of market forces being unleashed upon regulatory power in a distorted or unfair way. It's not to say, as I think I said in response to Ding, Ding's question, it's not to say that we should simply copy and paste the EU single market over into the UK. It is about finding unique solutions for the UK context. But this bill offers a solution, I think, which is very difficult from a devolved perspective. Thank you very much for that, Professor Dugan, and thank you, Convener. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Ewing. Uh, we now move to questions from Oliver Mundell. Thank you, uh, Convener. I mean, I find some of the kind of hypothetical explorations quite bizarre, uh, given you know, that there's already huge alignment on standards uh, within the UK, uh, and there's been clear commitment time and time again uh, from the UK government uh, that uh, they don't want to see a reduction in many standards as a result of leaving the EU. Uh, so I think uh, that you know I just want to put that point on record. Uh, I'm also uh, a bit depressed, really, uh, when I hear people. Uh, questioning this issue around English dominance and the size of England, because I see that as one of the trends for Scotland of being part of the United Kingdom, uh, because you can look at it uh, from, from the other side as well, which is that Scottish uh, producers, Scottish manufacturers, people living in Scotland uh, get the benefits uh, of selling their products into a significantly larger uh, market. Um, and In particular, I wanted to ask Professor Keating uh, whether this issue uh, around the size of England is, is new in constitutional terms, or whether it's something that's been uh, accommodated well uh, within uh, the, the, the United Kingdom's constitutional settlement, um, and you know, whether devolution in itself is an example uh, of, of the considerable uh, flexibility uh, that our constitution allows, and whether the internal market will just be another uh, part of that evolving picture. Yeah, the, the, the asymmetry and the dominance of England is, is a fact. It's, it's been present ever since the Union and since the devolution settlement. That has been a fact as well. The fact that there's one government, there's the English government and the British government, they're the same thing. This is a fact. We can't get around that unless we're going to federalise the United Kingdom. And that's not going to happen. We've just got to work with that. This bill, however, exacerbates that for the reasons that Michael has spelt out, that it unleashes these market principles. It allows people to go to court to get Scottish, uh, or at least to get access to Scottish Parliament, Scottish um, markets for goods that have not been approved uh, in Scotland. That dynamic, the ability of people then to go to court to raise issues constantly, that's a new principle that oh, didn't exist before. And as my request, the sheer weight of England is going to mean that English standards will lose out in that race. As for the UK government committing to maintain standards, absolutely it has done so. I see no doubt, no, no reason to doubt their sincerity there. But one parliament cannot bind a future parliament. A government cannot bind a future government. Uh, and so we're introducing <coughs> constitutional legislation effectively here that would give the UK government, future UK government, enormous powers. That would require some kind of justification. And it does raise the question as to whether it is shifting the constitutional balance of power in a way that we might find difficult to reconcile with the spirit of devolution. But I mean, it's, I think it's hard to you know it's it's hard to argue on one hand uh, you know that the English you know dominance uh, you know is, is going to be a problem, and then at the same time argue that the, the kind of main focus of all of this will be that. Uh, English producers will be desperate to get into the Scottish market. I think there's a, I, I think that that does work uh, both ways. Particularly, uh, you know, I think when there are inbuilt protections already, I think that uh, common frameworks uh, will respect the right uh, for devolved uh, divergence um, and mean uh, that these commonly agreed uh, principles will have to be complied with across the UK. Is that not correct? 
Well, that raises the question of, of, of frameworks then. We, we haven't really talked about that. <clears throat> and the bill and the accompanying papers really make no reference to the framework. So what I'd like to see is more detail on how this relates to frameworks, whether this is a replacement for frameworks, whether it cuts across frameworks, or whether this is simply intended as a backstop to be used in the case that frameworks don't, don't work, that there are gaps in the framework coverage. And is that the powers of If it was intended as a backstop, is that is, is that something that's more palatable? Well, 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 yes, but once again, I would emphasize the, except the, the principle of consent. If it's a backstop, then the issue is not as big as, 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 as we might think potentially. One can identify issues, one can deal with issues as they come up in, in a political process, in an intergovernmental process. Because I think, again, everybody's agreed with the principle we should have free trade throughout the United Kingdom. That's, that's not at, at stake. There are huge benefits for that. The difficulties will arise, A, as to what constitutes free trade and what restrictions are permissible on environmental, social, or ethical, or other grounds, and secondly, on the basis by which decisions will be made about the nature of the UK single market, uh, whether that will be simply a decision for Westminster or something made jointly by the government. Thank you. Thank you. Um, have you finished, Mr Mundell? Uh, yes, that's me finished, convener. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, we now bring in Kenneth Gibson, MSP. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, convener, and good morning, panel. A really fascinating discussion this morning so far. Uh, I've got a mountain of things to ask, but obviously I'll have to keep it uh, brief given time, etc. So I'll get on with it. Uh, Professor Keating, in the Section 9 constitutional implications of the and I quote, the United Kingdom remains a unitary state in which Westminster has merely lent powers to Scotland. We also um, go on to say subsequently that the Internal Market Bill follows uh, the logic that the UK is a unitary state with powerful devolved legislatures, as well as increasing devolution across Scotland. So I'm just wondering whether the content of the bill delivers on that latter statement, and what the other um, witnesses, the other professors, have to say about that too. Well, there's always been a certain ambivalence written into the devolution settlement. It was a political compromise. Some people say it's quasi-federal, <coughs> it's moving towards <coughs> a federal type system, if not a federation. Other people say, no, it's a devolved unitary state. Now, <coughs> these are just words. That's an abstract argument. What, what do we mean by those? <coughs> but I was struck that the UK government in the white paper used the term unitary state, <coughs> which suggests that not only does Westminster have the ultimate sovereignty, but Westminster feels free to intervene across a wide range of policy areas, and that the powers that are devolved to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland are in no way entrenched. Now, there are other aspects of this bill that <clears throat> back that out. The <clears throat> provisions about uh, state aid, uh, the provisions about spending in devolved uh, uh, areas. But it has struck me, or I wondered why the UK government used that phrase and then followed through with it. Now, that has always been there. <clears throat> and following the referendum of 2014, we heard a lot about getting close to a federal system, entrenching the civil convention, or putting it in legislation, and so on. This all seems to be about <clears throat> providing some degree of entrenchment for devolution, some degree. Whereas this bill provides no institutional safeguards for the devolved governments and parliaments. It merely says that the UK government will exercise these powers with restraints and with in consultation with the devolves. And that exposes something that's been in the devolution project for a long time, but it does seem to me to represent a slightly different direction of travel back to the notion of a unitary state rather than towards a kind of federal state. And if we look at what single market principles are, <coughs> elaborated in other countries, and as Michael said, they are elaborated in other jurisdictions. I don't know another case where the single market rules are set and implemented unilaterally by the central government, rather than through some intergovernmental process. Okay, thank you. And Professor Dugan? I'll just make three, three quick points as a follow-up to, to what Michael said. Um, I think the first point is that we really have to distinguish between devolution as it will exist 
on paper versus devolution as it will happen in practice under the influence of this bill, if it's enacted in its current form. Um, on paper, the UK government is correct to say that devolved powers will continue to exist, and in fact, thanks to Brexit, they may even increase in certain areas. But of course, it's an entirely different proposition to say in practice, by the way, if you exercise some of those devolved competences, you're only able to enforce them against your own producers or traders. You can't enforce them against imported goods coming from the rest of the UK. For all of the reasons that we've discussed, there, there will be a very significant difference between what devolution looks like on paper versus how devolution will operate in practice, thanks to this bill. Um, the second quick point to make is that um, these aren't purely hypothetical issues. And, and just to take issue with, with Oliver's point before, internal markets are not some sort of end state where you agree the rules and then that's it, you can forget about it and they just administer themselves. Internal markets, and this is the common experience of, of pretty much every jurisdiction across the world, are processes of market management. Laws change, social problems arise, technology throws up new products and new services, consumer preferences change, and the whole point of an internal market is to find solutions to constantly evolving problems. So to simply dismiss these issues as hypothetical examples is to, I think, fundamentally miss the point of what an internal market is. It's not just a set of rules that you agree once and then that's them set in, in tablets of stone. It's about finding constant ways of managing trade relations between territories on an ongoing basis. And I think the, 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 the third key point then is to, is to just re recall um, that the fundamental assumption underpinning this bill is basically that the exercise of devolved competences creates a problem. And, and although the bill doesn't say it in those words, that's the fundamental assumption which I think underpins the entire design of this bill. Devolved competences are capable of creating trade barriers, and trade barriers are a problem that need to be managed. Now, that's a perfectly legitimate fundamental assumption to make from a particular political perspective. It is not the fundamental starting point that I would assume, and I suspect that many other people, um, particularly in Scotland and Wales, would not share that assumption. But it is the clear assumption which underpins this bill. The exercise of devolved competences is a problem that needs to be managed. And I think it's really that fundamental starting assumption which helps explain so many of the problems and issues that we're talking about in the technical detail of this bill. Okay, thanks, Professor Bernard. I just have one point um, to build on what Michael Dugan has just said. This is a class, this is a well-known divide um, that you find in EU law to the distinction between existence and exercise. The devolved competences exist and on paper show that you've got uh, all of this has gone to Scotland and Wales, but this bill is significantly constraining the exercise of those competences. And because of the absence of a robust and well-rounded range of exceptions, particularly in respect of the application of the mutual recognition principle, therefore, essentially, exercise undermines existence. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, basically, you know, in Mr. In Professor Dugan's paper, it says, unlike the EU system, there are no guarantees that the UKIM will operate according to certain minimum common standards in fields such as health, environment, consumer and employment protection. And the bill is explicit that a good market angle, even the total absence of any uh, relevant public interest regulation, is still entails to benefit from the principle of mutual recognition when it comes to sale of supply in Scotland. Now, if we actually look at how Europe and the UK might digress in terms of standards, Scottish exports will have to produce at least the high standard, uh, will they not? So I'm just wondering uh, Professor Dugan, if this is likely de facto to mean either a, either a move to the high standards across the board uh, in Scotland, or will export standards to the EU, for example, be higher for some products which are exported than in those enjoyed at home? I think I think the answer to that question is partly to do with how um, individual Scottish producers and traders decide to orient it, their own market behaviour. Um, earlier. If Scottish producers and traders want to trade with the EU, then they have to meet EU regulatory standards. 
Um, if Scottish traders and producers want to focus purely on the Scottish market, then they'll meet Scottish standards. If they want to focus on the UK market, then they'll have particular problems with Northern Ireland because they'll have to satisfy the particular standards applicable in Northern Ireland under the protocol agreed on the withdrawal agreement. The bill, this bill, really is about the trade of Scottish um, producers or traders with England and Wales on the terms of the bill itself. So I think I think the answer to your question is um, the choices which have to be made by individual Scottish traders are about complying with the regulatory standards that that are applicable to the market they want to sell into. I think that's different from the question of whether Scotland, as a set of institutions, for example, wanted to track or meet. EU standards on a continuous basis, voluntarily in the exercise of Scottish competences. If that's what Scot Scottish institutions wish to do, to voluntarily track EU standards and match what the EU does in the relevant fields, then of course that will help Scottish exporters when it comes to accessing the EU market. But the operation of this bill will mean, as we've said before, that it doesn't stop English imports which satisfy the requirements in the bill from entering the Scottish market. So I think I think there are different relationships at work there. Thanks. And just and you also said that the UK's rejection of any close future relationship with the EU means there will be no coherent external reference point for the future evolution of internal UK trade. I'm just wondering if you can expand on that a wee bit and the implications thereof. Sure. Um, so one of the main reasons why the whole issue of the UK internal market hasn't been such a uh, an issue in, in political terms or in legal terms until now is because during the period of EU membership, after the creation of devolution in the late 1990s, um, EU standards effectively solved many of these problems. We, we were members of the single market. We um, uh, were involved in the adoption of harmonisation legislation by the EU. Um, we applied that legislation across the whole of the UK, and so many of the trade barriers that we might have worried about if that framework didn't exist were actually handled through the EU processes. That's not to say that particular problems didn't arise, and one of the main examples we always give is university tuition fees in Scotland. You know that that was a situation which fell outside the scope of EU law, should tuition fees by English students in Scotland. So there were little gaps in the EU system, but effectively the EU provided a solution to many of these problems. Once the transition period expires and we're no longer um, members of the single market and we're no longer following EU standards, then we have to have a replacement. Now again, much of our discussion has been about whether this bill is the right replacement. Um, but we need to have some sort of replacement. So without a clear external reference point, such as the EU single market, we'll need to come up with a new reference point of our own. The point about the lack of a clear commitment to minimum standards in the UK is really just about parliamentary sovereignty. It's a basic constitutional proposition. Um, the UK government can promise not to lower standards, but of course there's never any constitutional guarantee that a future UK government will actually maintain that promise if it has a stable working majority in the House of Commons. So these are political promises, but they're not constitutionally enforceable promises. Thank you. And just one brief last point, if I may. Um, you've also said in your paper, Professor Dugan, that the basic effect of the Internal Market Bill would be to act as a powerful disincentive for Scotland to change its existing rules on minimum alcohol pricing. Again, can you just um, expand on that a wee bit for the record? Thanks. Sure, sure. Um, in, in the written paper which I submitted, I've sort of worked through that example in a bit more detail, but I'll, I'll give a brief summary now. So um, the first question is, is a change to minimum alcohol pricing a substantive change to existing legislation? And I think the answer to that is, is almost certainly yes. If you're going to change the actual rule which applies to minimum <coughs> alcohol pricing, or substantively changing existing laws, and therefore it falls within the scope of the bill. The next question is, do you categorise minimum pricing as a product requirement governed by mutual recognition, or as a selling arrangement governed by non-discrimination? In, in terms of the bill itself, it doesn't give an explicit answer, but it would be completely orthodox in trade law terms to categorise minimum pricing as a product requirement subject to mutual recognition.
In that case, Scotland can have changes to its minimum alcohol pricing, but it couldn't enforce those prices against imported English alcohol because the only exception available is to prevent the spread of a pest disease or an unsafe foodstuff. And clearly, that does not apply to the consumption of beer or wine. So the, the worked out example um, of minimum alcohol pricing shows how, in a way, how the operation of the bill means that Scotland can insist that its own domestically produced alcohol has to have a minimum price, a revised minimum price, but that is unenforceable against imported English alcohol. And what's the point of having the rule at all? Because all you're doing is penalising your own producers by raising the price of their goods and not being able to enforce the actual public interest objective that the rule exists to serve in the first place. Thank you. Thanks, Camille. Thank you very much, Mr Gibson. I think we have a brief supplementary from Dean Lockhart on this subject. Thanks very much, Convener. I'll keep it brief. I wanted to clarify the operation of, of the common frameworks, which both governments want to apply potentially to the vast majority of trade in the internal market. The common frameworks, many of which will be enshrined in legislation, will recognise regulatory divergence across the UK and will provide that devolved standards must be complied with by producers from all parts of the UK. So, If the common standards are in place and they provide for uh, devolved regulation and, and uh, require producers across the UK to comply with the devolved standards, do, does that not deal with a number of these concerns? Uh, perhaps, sorry, uh, Professor, a single sentence response would be good. I'm sorry. Uh, perhaps. Professor Barnard first. Um, I would say no. Well, it would if it worked, but it's not enshrined in legislation. And the only thing that we've got in legislative form, assuming the bill becomes law, is the legislative framework that we've been discussing um, this morning. And so, therefore, um, the basic principles that we've articulated that um, uh, English goods, which may be made to a lower standard, must be sold in Scotland unless they very high thresholds. Um, laid down in the schedule are met. Okay. Um, before I pass on to the others, uh, my understanding is, and common frameworks are obviously a bit of a moving feast, my understanding is some of the common frameworks will be enshrined in legislation. So, assuming that uh, some of them are enshrined in legislation, that would embed regulatory divergence. Good. And assuming that the later act in time, the principle of parliamentary sovereignty would say that those later acts would trump um, the internal market bill. But you would like to think that some thought would be given to how the, the common frameworks in legislative form fit with the internal market bill. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Professor Keating and then uh, Professor Dugan, please. Uh, yeah, yes, to, to take up Catherine's last point, it, it's surprising that the, these are two separate processes. And the frameworks process has been worked out in intergovernmental negotiations. The internal market hasn't. There were discussions. The Scottish Government didn't participate. The Welsh Government did participate until the end of last year. And after that, following that, the UK Government proceeded unilaterally. And this may explain the lack of articulation between these two processes. Common frameworks, some of them will be legislative. The idea is as few as possible will be legislative. Try and get other mechanisms. If they're legislative, they will be subject to the Civil Convention. Again, the UK government could override, but there's no evidence that they will do so. That it seems to me to cover most issues. If something that arises is not covered by common frameworks, I think there should be a mechanism for dealing with this. This bill really seems to me far too drastic a power, and giving the government, uh, the UK government, uh, enormous powers to address what might just be a marginal problem, which will arise in unanticipated, unanticipated circumstances. So I'd like to see some mechanism linked to common frameworks to deal with issues as they come up, which, are, which have escaped the framework or weren't, weren't anticipated at the time of the frameworks, but subject to the same principles of negotiation and consent. Uh, Professor Dugan, thank you. Uh, I, I, I essentially agree with, with Michael Keating, um, with, the, with the slight um, qualification that, of course, the, the common frameworks will capture a moment in time. And they'll capture it well, and they'll solve, solve some problems at that moment in time. But the common frameworks have to be capable of evolution dynamically 
with society, the economy, science, consumers, public health threats, and so on. My preference would be that the common frameworks provide the primary forum for dealing with those changes in society, law, regulation, consumers, and science, and so on. But this bill will provide the default solution if there is no common framework. So, yes, I agree, the common frameworks will solve many of these problems, and in my ideal world, the common frameworks will provide the primary form for continuing to solve them into the future. But this bill will have a role to play because it will apply by default of a common framework to, to future issues and changes and problems as they arise. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Now, um, Stuart Stevenson has a very important question about eels. Uh, thank you very much, convener. I'm looking at the EU's England and Wales Regulations 2009, and uh, at paragraph 5 it starts, any person who imports live eels into England and Wales must, and, a failure, and, and then a list of administrative requirements, which are quite onerous, and, and then a failure to comply is an offence. Uh, would it be possible for us in Scotland to fish for eels without imposing those expensive administrative uh, requirements, um, while meeting the same health requirements and environmental requirements, and therefore have a lower cost of production of eels and import them into England? And by the way, that provision in this particular, especially English um, issue, uh, I've discovered apply in quite a lot of different areas. Uh, of law. Uh, and the, the, the other one I, I would give is, at the moment, uh, you cannot describe a drink as being an alcoholic drink unless it has a minimum of 0.5 per cent alcohol within it. There is clearly a growing market for low alcohol uh, drinks. So, if in Scotland we lowered it to 0.4 per cent, and therefore could properly describe a 0.4 per cent alcohol beer as being beer, and therefore uh, have a competitive advantage against English beer producers, uh, would that be valid uh, under this legislation? Now, of course, I pick on beer and eels as two English iconic uh, issues, and I feel an evening standard uh, article contribution might be forming in my mind here. Uh, perhaps uh, starting with uh, Professor Dugan, who, who, who who talked about imported English alcohol, I've turned it on its head. Sure. I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not intimately familiar with the EELS regulations 2019, I'm afraid. Um, uh, the, the answer is that insofar as the requirements in those regulations relate to the physical characteristics of the product and the, the, the other issues which are identified in the bill as being subject to mutual recognition, then Scottish eels could be imported into England unless England can demonstrate that they would spread a disease, a pest, or an unsafe foodstuff. Insofar as the English requirements under the 2019 regulations relate more to the manner of sale of the eels rather than to the physical characteristics of the goods or how they were produced or harvested or, or, or so on, then if there's direct discrimination, which sounds unlikely, it would only be for a public health emergency. Whereas if there were indirect discrimination, then it would apply if there were a threat to public safety or security, which seems unlikely with the eels, or if there was a general threat to animal health. Um, so there are limited grounds upon which England could stop the Scottish eels entering um, the English market on Scottish terms, but it really depends on what the detail of the regulations are. But in principle, it does work the other way around. And the same would be true with the labelling requirements. Now, labelling requirements are very clear. They are part of the physical characteristic of the product. They would be subject to the mutual recognition rule. So the only grounds on which a labelling difference could be excluded from the English market is to stop the spread of a pest or disease or an unsafe foodstuff. But of course, we're talking here in a way still hypothetically because the, the existing rules would have to be amended substantively in order to be caught by this bill. If they remain the 2019 regulations in an unamended form, then they wouldn't be caught by the bill anyway. Okay, can I say if our other two professors have anything different to say, they could maybe come in. Um, but we are quite tight for time. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so that's the d definitive. Um, uh,
uh, on the eels from Professor Dugan. Um, I'd just like to finish up by actually um, going back to something that Professor Dugan said earlier, which was um, that the the bill um, really suggests that the exercise of devolved competency competency is itself a problem. And one of the things that has perplexed me about the um, the white paper is that par paragraph 85 of the UK government's uh, white paper says that while currently the cost of trading between the different constituent parts of the UK are low, an increase would be likely to have a significant impact on GDP in a modelled scenario where intra-UK trade costs increased the level seen between German states, UK GDP would reduce by 7.3 billion. I, I was perplexed as to why um, the UK government would choose German states as an example of trade barriers. I had always believed that um, the German economy worked extremely uh, smoothly, and obviously Germany is a very prosperous place, and there are lots of checks and balances in the German lander. So I just wondered if anybody had, had a, a view on why the UK government would have used that particular example, uh, if it wasn't that it was in some way ideologically opposed to all devolved systems. Could, could I come in on that? I, that, that? That really struck me. There, there are, in fact, a surprising number of regulatory differences in, amongst the German lender, although on big policy issues, they tend to be go, go, go uh, together. Uh, but when it comes to regulation, there are a lot. But this would imply, because in Germany, of course, the EU single market rules apply. And so the suggestion here is the EU single market rules or internal market rules are, are too liberal for Germany. Uh, the, 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 the Germany, in spite of the UK internal market, has too much divergence, which suggests that the UK government wants uh, something tighter than the existing EU regime, whereas what we'd understood was it was just replacing the EU regime, giving the same degree of discretion as Scotland has under the EU. That's, that, that really was, was, was what struck me uh, about this. As to the costs, yes, regulation costs. It costs money. But for, for those costs, we get environmental benefits, social benefits, or, or whatever, meeting other kinds of goals. So the question is not whether it costs, the question is whether it's worth paying that cost to achieve the non-monetary objective. Thank you very much. Does anyone else want to come in on that, Professor Duggan? No. Uh, I've, I've Barnard? <laughs> Professor Barnard? Uh, I would say that there are a number of oddities in the white paper. Um, not least that um, the principle of mutual recognition, which um, is so well known under EU law um, from the decision in Cassis de Dijon, is only mentioned once in a footnote on page 99. So there clearly was some politics going on here, but Lord only knows what. Okay. Um, can I thank our witnesses uh, very much for coming uh, to give evidence uh, to us today and also uh, for the written submissions, which are extremely helpful uh, to the committee. Um, and before I go, I should have said at the beginning of uh, the committee session today that uh, we have received apologies um, from uh, Ross Greer, who is now back on the committee full time but um, has had an issue, a family issue today, which meant that he couldn't come. So um, I just wanted to put that on the record. Um, so the committee will now consider our evidence in private. Um, this concludes our public part of the meeting. I will allow a couple of minutes for members to have a comfort break before we resume in private session. But once again, thank you very much to our three witnesses this morning. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.